Hello and welcome to another episode of Forge Talks, a show that gives me an excuse to put on a shirt and jeans once a week. The title of today's episode is To Your Health. Now, healthcare is at the top of everyone's mind at the moment. The coronavirus pandemic has forced people into an increasingly digital world with things like online doctor's visits and e-prescriptions becoming commonplace. I'm joined today by Forge Rock's Chief Technology Officer, Eve Mailer and VP for US Healthcare, Steve Guizdala. Guys, welcome. It's great to be back, Fraser, and I hope you're keeping well. Thank you, Fraser. Great to be here. So. Obviously, the healthcare industry has been rocked, I would say, um, in the last couple of years. And so as compared to 2019, what sort of trends are you seeing in healthcare this year compared to last year? Well, it's there's some really interesting data available, Fraser. Actually, Ford Rock has published a consumer identity breach report, and it shows some super interesting data about data breaches. So in 2019, Healthcare was actually the industry most impacted by data breaches. 45% of data breaches were for the uh, against the healthcare industry. Wow. And I know, right? 45%. And yet, and yet in Q1 of 2020, 51%, over half of the data breaches were against the healthcare industry. So, that's, that's not a great trend. <laughs> no. um, right? Uh, and indeed, it gets worse because medical details were the data type most targeted in Q1 of 2020, and that was 25% of the data types. Wow. So, and, and you know, even other kinds of data uh, can be used, not just medical details, to impact things like electronic health records. Right. Uh, why, why is it that healthcare data is such like it's such a big target. What, how can it be used by attackers? Well, the biggest difference is, uh, Fraser, is that a medical record number is something that carries with you through everything, through insurance, through prescriptions, through uh, putting your uh, claims against your providers. And the difference is, is that a f attacker can take this both from a living human being as well as someone who's actually passed away because it's very difficult to shut that down. It's not like right. your it's not like your credit card. I mean, I hate to, to pick on the credit card industry, but we've <laughs> all had problems with breaches on our credit card, and it's a simple call the eight hundred number, talk to your credit card uh, provider, have it sure. canceled. They'll pick up the you know any type of uh, incidentals that happen with that. But with a medical record number, that is who you are, and that's something you can't do. Yeah, absolutely. So you, it's almost like a biometric. You know, think you think about you know your body. Well, it has to track your body, right? So the impacts on an individual can be really severe. Um, the FTC mm. actually has noted things like uh, the impacts of medical identity theft, uh, a bill for medical services you didn't receive, a call from a debt collector about a medical debt you didn't owe, a notice from a health plan saying you've reached your benefit limit. Um, and then there's other pr uh, impacts around like privacy. For example, somebody receiving benefits uh, on your plan might mean that there's data about somebody else inside mm -hmm. your health record and that might mean that you're barred from seeing data about yourself because somebody else's data is inside your record that's right. pretty severe yeah so true um eve you mentioned the uh the consumer identity breach report so what does the identity breach report say was the number one data breach method by cyber criminals and does it does that impact the healthcare industry more than other industries for example yeah, our consumer identity breach report showed that the number one data breach type by cyber criminals was unauthorized access. And honestly, the health IT industry is impacted by all the same challenges as other industries. And what does that mean? It means that they're impacted by poor access controls, weak authentication methods, and really a lack of governance, identity governance. Mm. And so, you know, it would benefit from things like modernization of identity and access control and strengthening authentication with um, better user experience around authentication. And so with respect then this year to COVID, what changes are you seeing in healthcare and, and how does that relate to identity? Well, to pick on you, Fraser, since you have this opportunity to put jeans on and a dress shirt for the day, <laughs> uh, you're probably lovely, by the way. <laughs> you're, you. pro you're probably doing the majority of your activities online, 
And this is highly applicable to healthcare as well. And so what we're seeing is a huge trend of uh, online participants going in and looking at things like records, checking results, uh, setting up patient visits, uh, all the scheduling that goes with it. And with that comes the need for scale. And sure. right now, the, from the healthcare payer and provider perspective, a huge influx, which ties back to Eve's comment about benefits from modernization and strengthening authorization. But I know Eve has some uh, some exact examples with respect to the COVID component as well. Absolutely. So, I mean, along with the need for huge scale, some specific examples include televisits, visits. Um, you know, all of our visits to doctors are now televisits or a lot of them now. Yeah. Um, and that can require things like fully remote onboarding to a portal, which we're not, that, that was actually not even allowed previously. Wow. Um, and so that requires a whole new kind of flow that needs to be implemented at scale, um, as well, hugely more mobile application use. So you've got a lot of people now downloading certain mobile applications, you know, portal applications for the first time. And that has presented more fraud opportunities. So the fraudsters are saying, hey, mobile applications, let's make a lookalike mobile app, get somebody to download it and trick people. So we've got to now design journeys for people. So onboarding journeys, authentication journeys that are stronger and yet easier to use. Mm, sure. And so I know things are different kind of the world around, but I've heard that in the US in particular, there are a lot of uh, there's been a lot of merger and acquisition uh, activity happening and healthcare providers uh, and payers are acquiring multiple smaller competitors. And so what are the issues then that arise in an identity and access management in these such scenarios? Yeah, you're spot on. The, the market itself is increasing, but the number of players in the space, both on the provider side and the payer side, is shrinking because uh, from a provider perspective, hospitals are acquiring tertiary hospitals and they're gaining more market share to get into other markets. Mm -hmm. And on the payer side, they're actually getting into the retail component as well. So we've got mergers between uh, health insurance and retail. And what happens is that that market continues to expand and by this consolidation of entities, disparate identity silos are hitting them across the enterprise. Um, and what this happens, results in is the inability to pass audit. So yeah. I've got identities in my existing system where that I'm a current employee, I get acquired by another company, now I have other things that come into it. So the increase in overall risk, um, what, and it goes back to original Eve's comment uh, in, the, in the onset, which is why does the healthcare market continue to expand from a cyber risk and threat perspective? And the reason being is it's a huge target. If I have access in other areas and I've forgotten about it, I've lost my, lost my credentials, it just creates this uh, mess from an identity perspective with all these different uh, capabilities and uh, silos that are just not communicating with each other. Yeah, it, uh, it's funny, uh, having spoken to a few customers over the years, it's funny how often this merger and acquisitions thing leads to a, a sudden need to uh, invest in identity systems. As the population continues to age, with 15% of the US population falling into the elderly category, what changes to healthcare companies need to start focusing on? The biggest part of that, Fraser, is connecting with patients, um, you know, for the provider side, members for the payer side, and they really need to consider connecting with all methods of communication. And what I mean by that is, and, and you've mentioned this before, people are going into portals which weren't allowed before. People are now using their phones, their tablets, their computer, and even old school phones, where <laughs> someone says, I don't have a smartphone and I have a landline, which ironically still exists. But the, <laughs> the experience with that needs to be more relatable and akin to the retail omni-channel one versus sure. one channel, which is really where healthcare has been stuck is one channel. And things like this, I mean, that we take for granted because of using smartphones and doing a retail-like experience is that being able to reset your password. You log in once a year to go look at your medical record for maybe early enrollment. Mm -hmm. And you can't remember because you've changed your password 16 times since Sunday on your corporate side. <laughs> you can't remember who it is or what it is. Mm -hmm. So maybe perhaps moving to a password experience or maybe uh, providing a different way for them to get in. I believe all of those components need to be addressed, especially 
with the elderly population as we continue to increase. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, Steve is absolutely right. And you know, this omni-channel kind of experience actually extends to multiple human channels as well, if you want to think about it that way. We need to think about relationship management. In a lot of caregiver scenarios, you've got other people in a household, for example, caring for somebody else who may be kind of an offline person, if you will. So right. you've got what you might think of as doctor mom or my son the doctor, so to speak, mm. um, where you've got maybe an adult son caring for an elderly person. Mm. And in that case, that son may have to access the records of an elderly mother, something like that. And so you've actually got to arrange for somebody acting on behalf of somebody else. And so you're gonna wanna have somebody be able to share the right level of access of a whole bunch of digital resources with somebody else to their level of comfort. And then if some particular relationship changes, let's say a spousal relationship, that can end as we know um, in somebody's life, um, you may need to sort of unshare all those uh, resources. Mm. Um, and there's a particular technology um, that, that we use, it's a standard um, I'm involved with, a lot of others have implemented as well, called User Managed Access, UMA. And you can use UMA in concert with this notion of identity relationship management for really powerful healthcare use cases. Mm. Yeah, honestly, my heart goes out to identity professionals in the healthcare industry because the need for flexibility and security, it feels like the stakes are so high. Absolutely. So, uh, sure are. Yeah, like I feel for anyone watching who can relate here. <laughs> so um, what results are your healthcare customers achieving by then focusing their efforts on identity? It really ties back to all the components we've talked to previously. Uh, number one, we talked about the elderly population, so increasing member and patient satisfaction. And that ties into Eve's comment on user-managed access, uh, not having to share a password, being able to go in and manage things for elderly or a caregiver component. Uh, we talked about the merger and acquisition component, right? Well, how does that fit in? By eliminating risk. So we're looking at that anomalous access and understanding, uh, Fraser, as you mentioned, bigger acquisitions coming into other acquisitions and understanding where our risks are for workforce, our internal people, and even external, so patients and members. And all that ties into removing cost, because now we're not looking at disparate systems, we're trying to figure out how do I make all these work together. Uh, we're trying to see, is there a better path to move forward by uh, decreasing reliance and maintenance on those disparate systems, which ultimately leads to operational efficiency. So understanding, what do I actually have? I mean, that's. It seems like a common question, but it really is something that, that is occurring quite dramatically in healthcare with the acquisitions is, I don't know what I have for identity or governance, or if I do, I know it's urban sprawl and it's yeah. everywhere. And how do I look at that, understand it and control it and make more effective decisions as to what I'm doing from either governance to pass an audit or what I'm looking at from a uh, entitlement perspective in order to reduce risk. And those are all the components that we see uh, our customers achieving by focusing on identity. That's right. I mean, healthcare is really a story of needing to achieve interoperability, data portability, and security, and privacy, and some great experiences, right? Yeah, yeah. you have to sort of achieve the whole package. Mm -hmm. And that's something we're really helping our customers achieve every day. Um, and you know, it's, it's a no compromise scenario. It's really important for people's health and their satisfaction now particularly in a digital scenario. Sure. Well, that's brilliant, guys. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to, to talk through that uh, with us. It was, yeah, really, really great. Thank you. Truly enjoyed it. Thank you. Absolutely. Guys, hope you enjoyed that and we'll catch you next time.